Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, what a joy and a privilege it is to come into your presence, to sing praises to your name, to speak with you in prayer, and to hear you speak with us through the ministration of your holy word. We ask that as we open that word, that your Holy Spirit will hover over this place and give us clear minds and tender hearts to receive the message that you have for us. We thank you for the privilege of approaching your throne boldly, knowing that you hear us and you answer. And Father, we ask that you will answer, because we ask it in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'd like to begin our study today at that verse which has basically been the theme of the Genesis series. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Here God is speaking to the serpent. He's speaking to Satan, to the devil. And notice what he says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. So notice that there's going to be enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. And then the last part of the verse says, He shall bruise your head, that is the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3 and 15, verse 15, speaks about two seeds. One seed is righteous, and the other seed is wicked. But in our study this morning, we don't want only to talk about the righteous seed and the wicked seed. In fact, we're going to discover that there's only one kind of righteous seed but there are actually two types of wicked seeds. Now, you're probably wondering what I mean by two types of wicked seeds. Well, the fact is that in our study today we're going to notice that there is one type of work wicked person who is overtly wicked. In other words, openly wicked. We would call them ungodly. And by the way, this type of individual would be illustrated by the publicans and the sinners of Christ's day, outcasts of society, ungodly, so to speak. But then there's a second type of wicked seed, and that is those who are covertly wicked. In other words, they don't appear wicked on the surface but they are wicked actually in their thoughts and in their hearts. They are covertly wicked. And of course this type of wicked person is illustrated by the scribes and the Pharisees. And so when Genesis 3.15 speaks about a wicked seed, we need to understand that that seed includes two different types of wicked people. First, those who are overtly wicked, in other words, they live a disorderly lifestyle and don't care much about it, and those who are covertly wicked, in other words, they put on a wonderful veneer, a wonderful exterior, but their hearts and their minds are far away from God, illustrated by the scribes and the Pharisees. Now in our study today we are going to particularly take a look at the second type of wicked seed. Those who are covertly wicked. Those who have a wonderful front but whose hearts and who, whose minds are alienated from God. Now this type of wicked person is illustrated in the parable of the wheat and the tares. This parable is found in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 24 through 30. And basically I'm going to read the passage and then we're going to go back and interpret the symbols of this parable. 
Matthew chapter 13 and verses 24 to 30. It says this, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is the famous parable of the wheat and the tares. And we're going to notice that the tares in this parable represent a particular type of wicked person. A person who does not appear wicked, but in the sight of God is even more wicked than those who are overtly unrighteous. Now we have several symbols in this parable. Let's take a look at the symbols in order. Back to Matthew 13 and verse 24. Matthew 13 and verse 24. We have three symbols here that we want to interpret. It says there in verse 24, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field three symbols. Number one, the sower, who is referred to as a man. Second symbol, good seed. And the third symbol, the field where the seed is planted. So we have a sower, we have good seed, and we have a field. Now what is represented by these three symbols? Let's go down to the interpretation that Jesus gave of this parable. And it's wonderful that Jesus gave an explanation of the parable. He didn't always do that. Notice Matthew 13 and verses 37 and 38. Matthew 13, 37 and 38. He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So we know who the sower is. The sower is Jesus. Then it says, the field is the world. And by the way, I'm going to qualify that. It is not just the world in general. It is the church of Jesus in the world. We're going to notice that as we study along. It's particularly the church as the church is found in all of the places of the world. So it says, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And now notice, the good seeds are the what? The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. That's another way of saying the righteous, the saved, if you please. And so you have three symbols. You have the sower, the good seed, and the field. The sower is Jesus. The good seed are the righteous, and the field represents the world, more specifically, the church of Jesus as it is found in the world. But there's more to this parable. Notice Matthew 13 verses 25 and 26. We have here three additional symbols in the parable. It says there in verse 25, 
but while men slept I want you to notice that, that's very important, we're going to come back to it in a moment but while men slept should they have been vigilant? should the men have been vigilant? should those who take care of the field have been vigilant? absolutely! but while men slept particularly referring to the leaders of the church his enemy came so they're sleeping there's an enemy who comes and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way so we have tares now what do these symbols represent? the symbol of sleep the enemy and the tares well we don't have to guess because in Matthew 13, 38 and 39 Jesus explains the symbols it says there but the tares are the sons of the wicked one so what do the tares represent? the tares represent the sons or the seed of the wicked one and who is this wicked one? it says the enemy who sowed them is the devil so you have sleeping you have the enemy and you have the tares now allow me to read you a very interesting statement that we find in Testimonies to the Church volume 3 page 113 about the sleeping aspect of this parable the author Ellen White had this to say if faithfulness and vigilance had been preserved if there had been no sleeping or negligence upon the part of enemy of, of any the enemy would not have had so favorable an opportunity to sow tares among the wheat then she says this Satan never sleeps he is watching and he improves every opportunity to set his agents to scatter error which finds good soil in many unsanctified hearts this is a very telling statement if the church were awake the church would be able to make sure that the enemy did not plant tares in the church but because many times the church is under the effects of anesthesia or the church is sleeping and not vigilant the devil comes in and he plants tares and we can't even tell what the devil is doing by the way even worse than sleeping and have the devil plant the tares in the church is the idea of knowingly planting tares in the church and you say pastor are you saying that sometimes tares are planted in the church by the servants? that's exactly what I'm saying I'd like to read another statement that we find in Testimonies, volume 5, page 172. You know, we, we live in a world, in a religious world, where everybody thinks that that which is big and spectacular is the best. And so we have the idea that we need to plant mega churches, churches with 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 members and we, we have the idea that we want to fill the church but the question is what are we filling the church with? is it just possible that not only are we are we sleeping and allowing the devil to come and plant the tares but we are knowingly participating in the process of planting the tares allow me to read this statement, very telling statement, powerful she says this the accession of members accession means the entrance of members who have not been renewed in heart and reformed in life is a source of weakness to the church I'm going to read that again 
the accession of members who have not been renewed in heart and reformed in life is a source of weakness to the church. And we say that strength is in numbers. Think again. Strength is in piety. Strength is in character. She continues saying, this fact is often ignored. And now she's going to meddle with me. Some ministers and churches are so desirous of securing an increase of numbers that they do not bear faithful testimony against unchristian habits and practices. Let them come in. The importance is having just lots of people in the church. She continues saying, Those who accept the truth are not taught that they cannot safely be worldlings in conduct while they are Christians in name. Heretofore they were Satan's subjects. Henceforth, henceforth they are to be subjects of Christ. The life must testify to the change of leaders. Public opinion, we would call them polls today, public opinion favors a profession of Christianity. Little self-denial or self-sacrifice is required in order to put on a form of godliness and to have one's name enrolled upon the church book. Hence, many join the church without first becoming united to Christ. In this, Satan triumphs. Now notice this. Such converts are his most efficient agents. Are the openly irreligious the greatest threat to the church? No. She says such converts are the devil's most efficient agents. They serve as decoys to other souls. They are false lights, luring the unwary to perdition. It is in vain that men seek to make the Christian path broad and pleasant for worldlings. God has not smoothed or widened the rugged narrow way. If we would enter into life, we must follow the same path which Jesus and His disciples trod, the path of humility, self-denial, and sacrifice. That is a powerfully telling statement. And I fear sometimes that even within our own church, not our own lo local church, but within the Seventh-day Adventist church, we're so anxious to grow in numbers that we don't present a clear and decided testimony so that we make sure that people know what they're deciding for before they join the church, before they are baptized. And as a result what happens is we are consciously planting tares within the church. Not even sleeping anymore, but actually knowingly doing this. Now you notice in this parable that it says that the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Now allow me to pursue that just for a moment. Notice John chapter 8 and verse 44. Remember we're talking about a particular type of wicked person today. We're not talking about those who are openly wicked. We're not talking about those who are overtly unrighteous. You know, you can tell by their lives that uh, they don't profess Christianity. They don't care about religion. They don't care about ordering their, their lives according to the Ten Commandments. We're talking about a covert type of wicked person, which in the sight of Jesus was the worst type. Now in John 8 verse 44, Jesus is speaking, listen up, to religious people. He's not speaking to the publicans and sinners. He's speaking to the righteous. And notice what he says to them. You are of your father the devil. What are the tares? The sons of whom? The sons of the wicked one. Now Jesus says to these religious people, 
You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. I find it amazing here that Jesus would call those religious people, the scribes, the Pharisees, those who went to the temple and worshiped God every day, those individuals who apparently had great piety, and Jesus would say to them, You are of your father the devil. You are the devil's seed, in other words. Amazing! So is it possible to be religious and still be the seed of the devil? Absolutely. And I know that what I'm saying here is not politically correct, but it's the truth. As they said to Martin Luther once, you know, when he stood there at the Diet of Worms, he says, my, con my, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other. They said, that is heresy, Dr. Luther. And Luther says, heresy, but it is the truth. Now I want you to notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. Here it speaks about someone else who is of this type of wicked person. 1 John 3 and verse 12. Speaking about an individual who is called Cain. Anybody ever heard of Cain? Let me ask you, was Cain a religious person? Was he? Sure he was. Did he raise an altar? Yes. Did he bring an offering? He sure did. Did he come and present the offering? Did he bow and worship the Lord? He most certainly did. He was a religious person. And yet I want you to notice 1 John 3 verse 12. It says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. Whose seed was he? But he was religious. He went through all the forms. But it says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brother's righteous. By the way, is this story going to be repeated? In this Genesis series, we studied a whole lecture on the Battle of Armageddon. And we analyzed in detail the story of Cain and Abel. And we noticed that this story is actually a small-scale model of what's going to happen at the very end of time. The only difference is that at the beginning you have two individuals, at the end you have two worldwide groups. Is it just possible that they, at the end of human history, those who profess to be religious, those who are overtly religious, are actually going to become persecutors of God's people? Do you know that Jesus said in John 16 verses 1 and 2 that the day is coming when those who kill you will actually think that they're doing God a service? It's amazing. The end time scenario is not of irreligious people, apostate people, worldly people, becoming the enemy of God's people. The scenario is people who profess to be religious coming against God's people. Notice also John chapter 6 and verse 70. John chapter 6 and verse 70. It's speaking here about Judas Iscariot. That's a very interesting story. Notice what Jesus had to say about Judas. John 6 and verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? What did Jesus call Judas? He called him a devil. Now, let's take a look at Judas. Was Judas part of the inner circle? Did he claim to follow Jesus? He most certainly did. Did the disciples think that he had a promising future? Oh yes. I mean, even till the very end, Judas had the disciples deceived. Was he a tear in the midst of the wheat? Absolutely. In fact, when Jesus said to Judas, what you're going to do, go and do it quickly, the disciples were so blind 
that they thought that Jesus was sending Judas on an errand. They didn't understand that Jesus was saying, Go and betray me. They were so blinded because Judas was a very capable man. You find in Desire of Ages a description of him. He was the tallest of the disciples. Very wise when it came to the administration of money. A shrewd businessman, you might say. You know, very charismatic. and They considered him a great asset for the future of the church. And yet Jesus said, One of you is a devil. One in the inner circle. A tear, if you please. Do you know that the scribes and the Pharisees were also tares? They were also of this second type of wicked person or unrighteous person. And by the way, God considers this type of unrighteous person worse than the one who is overtly unrighteous and worldly. If you don't believe it, you remember the story of the Pharisee and the publican? They came to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee says, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men. I fast twi twice a week. I pay tithe from everything that I earn. And he says, I especially thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this miserable, overt publican that has come to worship here. Let me ask you, who went home justified? Jesus said that the publican went home justified, the overt sinner went home justified because he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He repented of his sin, and it was more acceptable for him than it was for the person who had this righteous, holy veneer. Notice what, we, what Jesus said in Matthew 23 and verse 33. Speaking about the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus had to say this. Politically incorrect language, folks. Jesus said, Serpents, brood of vipers. Speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. Now let me ask you, what do snakes breed? Snakes. So if Jesus here calls these individuals serpents, who were they born from? They must have been born from the serpent, right? They're babies of the serpent, if you please. So Jesus says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Individuals who had a wonderful external veneer of righteousness, but in the sight of God wicked because their hearts were far away from God. Notice Matthew 23, 27 and 28. This is the famous chapter where Jesus pronounces His woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees. Matthew 23 verses 27 and 28, Jesus says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful, or yeah, beautiful outwardly. Let me ask you, have you seen some pretty nice looking graves? I've seen some real nice ones. You know, for those of you who are going to Battle Creek this fall, you're going to see some mausoleums that are incredible there at Oak Hill Cemetery. Impressive. Let me ask you though, what is inside there? It looks beautiful outside, but inside it's full of what? It's full of bones, dry bones. Notice, once again, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know, it's a sobering thought that the strongest words of rebuke of Jesus fell upon health-reforming, tithe-paying, Sabbath-keeping people. Thank you, Melvin. Hallelujah! You know, Jesus had a lot more to say about the self-righteous than about the unrighteous. I don't know whether you've noticed that. 
Now, I'd like to read another statement that we find in the book I, Our High Calling. This is a statement in a devotional book, Powerful. Notice what it says. Half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels. That's powerful stuff. Half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels. For their deceptive words and non-committal position lead many astray. The infidel shows his colors. No doubt where they stand. You know, if you want to know where they stand, just go to uh, San Francisco on Gay Pride Day. I mean, you know, I don't agree with what they do, but they come out and they proclaim it and they announce it. That's the first type of person. First type of Satan's seed. But there's a second type which is even worse. She says the infidel shows his own his colors. The lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. Both the infidel and the righteous. Now notice this. He is neither a good worldling nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. What kind of Christians are you? What kind of Christian am I? Am I a good seed? Or do I fit in one of these two categories of seeds that we're discussing this morning? Now you'll notice in the parable that the servants say to the owner of the field, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to pluck up the tares so they don't damage the wheat? In fact, let's read it. Matthew 13, 27 to 29. Matthew 13, 27 through 29. It says here, the servants of the owner, I like to think of those as the pastors, the servants of the owners came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? In other words, pull up the tares? But he said, No, lest you gather up the tares and you also uproot the wheat with them. So in other words, the tares and the wheat are supposed to grow together until when? Until the harvest. You say, well, pastor, I guess that means that there's no church discipline. Do you know we live in a period of time when, when if discipline is applied to someone, they say, oh, that's so unkind to put someone on censure or to remove someone from the church books. That's not kind. We live in a time such as that. In a discipline-less society, and so you say, but here, pastor, it says that you're supposed to let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. That's true. But allow me to read you a statement that gives the balance and the explanation about the fact that this doesn't mean that we're to allow anything in the church. Anything goes. Even overt, open sin. This statement is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 71 and 72. Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. When someone practices open sin, do you have to judge their motives? For example, an individual in church commits adultery. If you say, we're, gonna, we're going to discipline you for committing adultery, would it be right for that person to say, you can't judge me? Of course not. Because the behavior is what? It's open. It's an open book. That's overt sin. And in those cases, Ellen White says that church discipline is 
not only allowable but desirable. She says Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. But, now notice this, but he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. In other words, you can judge the outside when the outside is openly contrary to God's will. Church discipline can and should be applied. But you cannot judge people's intentions and motivations. You cannot judge their character. You cannot judge their heart. Because only God can see that. She says He has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to Himself. Were we to deal with these souls according to our imperfect judgment, it would perhaps extinguish their last hope. Many who think themselves Christians will at last be found wanting. Many will be in heaven who their neighbors supposed would never enter there. Man judges from appearance, but God judges the heart. Now for those of you who think that perhaps God made a mistake by saying let the tares grow with the wheat and it would have been better to uproot the tares, God practices what He preaches. You remember the story of Lucifer in heaven? Did God know that Lucifer was a tear? Yes He did. Did He uproot him immediately? He did not. Did He allow the devil to remain there in the midst of the righteous and holy angels to do his vile work? Yes. In fact, a third of the angels sided with Satan or with Lucifer. Why didn't God pull up the tares right away? Because He knew that the angelic host would have doubts because it was necessary for the great controversy to come to full fruition where you could see the mature tares and the mature wheat together at the very end. And of course the moment came when the difference was clearly seen. The lines were drawn in heaven and then Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. So God Himself showed the principle. You also have the example of Judas Iscariot. Did Jesus know from the very beginning that Judas Iscariot was a tear? Of course He did. Why didn't He say, forget it, you're a tear. I don't want you as one of my disciples. Did He allow Judas to come in? Yes He did. In fact, do you know when that scribe came to Christ and he said, I'll follow you wherever I go, and Jesus says, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but man, the Son of Man doesn't have any place to lie his head. Do you know that that individual that came to Jesus was Judas? And Jesus was saying to Judas, listen, if you're in this for the loaves and fishes, if you're in this for fame and for money, you can forget it. Because there's no money in this. Birds have nests, I don't even have a nest. Foxes have holes, I don't have any place that I can call home. So Jesus tried to discourage him, but he still decided to join the disciples. And do you know, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that Judas was a source of contention among the disciples all the way through the ministry of Jesus. And yet the disciples thought he was great. And the tare and the wheat grew together until at the end of the three and a half year ministry of Jesus. The difference between Judas and the disciples is clearly revealed and clearly seen. And we all know what happened to Judas. Judas went, went and committed suicide and he hung himself. You see, if Jesus had uprooted Judas before this, the disciples would have thought, what is this man doing? This is one of the, this is one of the most pro, uh, prominent and one of the most promising prospects that we have in this group. But Jesus had to allow things to mature. Now we still have to talk about the harvest, the reapers, the binding, and the burning. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30. It says here, 
Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now there's four symbols that I want us to take a look at as we near the end of our study today. First of all, the harvest. Secondly, the reapers. Third, the binding. And fourth, the burning. By the way, all of these are stages in a process. What is represented by the process of separating the wheat from the tares and binding the tares and binding the wheat in bundles? Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7 has the answer. There's this angel, powerful angel that flies in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And he says in a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Let me ask you, when are the righteous separated from the wicked? Is it at the moment of the second coming of Christ? Is that when the righteous are separated from the wicked, when Jesus comes? No. The process takes place in heaven before the second coming of Jesus. Because after the first angel proclaims the hour of his judgment has come, when you get to the third angel's message, there you have the two harvests. You have the harvest of the earth and you have the grapes of the earth. They are totally separated. But the judgment took place in heaven before the second coming of Christ. Because if this angel announced the hour of his judgment has come, this is happening while the door of probation is still open, correct? What good would it be to preach that the hour of his judgment has come if probation is closed? It wouldn't do any good. And so this judgment takes place before the second coming of Christ on earth. That's when the wheat is tied in bundles, is separated from the tares. And the tares are separated from the wheat. In fact, allow me to read you a statement that we find in the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 72. Ellen White had a profound perception when it came to what the Bible teaches. She says this, The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. Did you catch that? The harvest is when? The second coming? The harvest is the end of probationary time. You know, we can go back to the story of Noah, which we've studied in this seminar before. When were the righteous saved and the wicked lost? Was it the moment it started to rain? Or was it when the door of the ark closed? Do you know the answer? The closing of the door took place before the rain. And so the closing of the door of probation for the world is going to close before Jesus actually comes to gather his people into his barn. So you'll have the separating of the wheat and the tares, and you have the tying of the wheat in bundles, and the tying of the tares in bundles. This represents the judgment that is taking place in heaven right now as I speak. Jesus is separating the righteous from the wicked and he's tying the righteous in bundles in such a way that when Jesus comes he will send his angels to gather the wheat into his barn. Now let's notice Matthew chapter 13 and verses 40 to 43. Matthew 13 verses 40 to 43. There are several things that we want to notice uh, in this passage. Here Jesus is explaining the meaning of uh, the harvest and the binding and the burning and so on. It says here, Therefore as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, 
And now I want you to notice a phrase that is very, very important. We have to read carefully. It says, and they will gather out of where? They will gather out of where? They will gather out of his kingdom. Did these individuals belong to his kingdom? How can he gather them out of his kingdom if they did not at some point belong to his kingdom? And so it says, and they will gather out of his kingdom whom? All things that offend. That word offend is very interesting. It usually applies in the Gospels to people who have been with Jesus, have followed Jesus, and at some point a stumbling block comes and they are offended. In fact in John 16 verses 1 and 2 Jesus says to the disciples, I'm telling you these things so that you are not offended. So the fact that these are gathered out of his kingdom, and the fact that the things that offend are gathered out indicates that these are not overtly wicked people. These are what? These are covertly wicked people. And so it says, they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. And now notice this, those who practice what? Lawlessness. And you say, oh well Pastor Boris, here there it is, these are people who are overtly wicked. They're openly wicked, it says that they're lawless. Let me ask you, do you remember that passage in Matthew chapter 7? In fact, let's go there just for a moment. Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 to 23. Don't miss this point. Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23. Here it says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, would these be Christians? Would they? Of course, a non-Christian would call Jesus Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Were these Christians? Sure they were. cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. Wow! Is it possible to apparently have the gift of prophecy, and to cast out demons, and to perform miracles, and not be on the side of Jesus? Do it all in the name of Jesus? Absolutely! Notice verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Yeah, because some people say, well pastor, you know they were once with God, you know when they cast out demons and they did these things in the name of Jesus, they were with Jesus and then they went astray. But the fact is, Jesus says here, I never knew you. Not, not even while they were casting out demons and prophesying in his name and doing miracles in his name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? You who practice lawlessness. So when this parable in Matthew 13 speaks of those who practice lawlessness, does that necessarily mean that it's talking about those who are overtly wicked? Absolutely not. Do you know folks that there is a lot of wickedness that goes on in the church unseen except by holy angels? People who come to church, they pray, they listen to sermons, maybe even come to prayer meeting. The religious life appears to be in order. But there's a second unseen life to human beings that is taking place behind the scenes. That's what this is talking about. And folks, I'll tell you, in the religious world today there's a lot of self-righteousness. There are people who, who are openly condemning gay marriage. And they're openly condemning abortion. When if you examine their lives, you would find that their lives are filled with hypocrisy. 
and that they are really living a lie. Because it's all a facade to gain power and to gain influence. And so Jesus says that He will gather out of His kingdom, notice, out of His kingdom, those that are, that are offended, that refers most of the time to the righteous, or professedly righteous, and those who practice lawlessness, Matthew 7 indicates that these are individuals who externally are okay, internally they have a problem. And now notice what He continues saying. And will cast them into where? into the furnace of fire. Let me ask you, when are the wicked cast into the furnace of fire? This parable actually takes us where? It takes us all the way to the period at the end of the millennium. In fact, do you know, just a little sidelight, do you know the Spirit of Prophecy says that those who are outside, there's going to be a group of individuals outside the holy city who are going to feel like God has, uh, has incorrectly put them out there? In fact, listen up. This passage in Matthew chapter 7, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we perform miracles in your name? Do you know when they're actually going to speak this according to the Spirit of Prophecy? They're outside the holy city and they're saying to the Lord, Lord, what are we doing out here? We're supposed to be inside. Wow! So that's not applying to the Second Coming, but to what happens after the Millennium. And so it says that they will be gathered, and they will cast, be cast into the furnace of fire. This is after the Millennium. And then notice, there will be, will be what? There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Some people say, see wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is the everlasting fire. It doesn't say anything about everlasting fire. It doesn't say endless everlasting wailing and gnashing of teeth. It simply says wailing and gnashing of teeth. And by the way, do you know that every time that Jesus uses that expression, wailing and gnashing of teeth in the Gospels, it applies to people who professed His name. He's always addressing it to the Hebrew nation, to the Jewish nation. That's another indication as to who the tares are. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But now notice the contrast with God's people. It says there, verse 43, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Have you learned anything this morning? Listen folks, we need to realize that just because we're in the church does not mean that we are in the kingdom. We need to realize that there are two kinds of wicked people in the sight of God. There are those who are overtly wicked, openly wicked. I mean you can tell it and people who commit works of wickedness in the church, members, they're supposed to be disciplined, disfellowshipped. No matter how much people say, oh that's unkind. No. Discipline is always loving and kind. But at the same time it's firm, because the God of love is also God of justice. Are you following me? And then of course you have the second kind of wicked person, which Jesus condemned more than the first type, and that is individuals who outwardly appear righteous before man, but inside are filled with wickedness. And basically they're living a double life, a life of hypocrisy. My question is, what kind of seed are you? Are you a son of the kingdom? Am I a son of the kingdom? Or are you one of these other two types of seeds that we've spoken about? I pray to God that we will be the seed of the woman's seed. That we will truly belong to those who are described as the righteous in this parable. 
that the inside will be in harmony with the outside. And that the outside will not only be a veneer hiding that which is inside. And by the way, folks, the inside and the outside must always be in harmony. Some people say, well, it, it, the only thing that matters is my heart. It doesn't matter what I do. God knows my heart. Well, the fact is, folks, that when the heart changes, the life changes. The problem is when we try to live the life and the heart isn't changed. That's the tears. And so what we, what we need is a conversion experience where we have a change of heart and the change of heart out of love for Jesus leads us to live a changed life life for His honor and for His glory. How about it? Do you want to live that kind of life that God would have us live? Praise the Lord. I pray to God that that will be our experience as we've studied this well-known parable of Jesus, of the wheat and the tares.